tonight's uh, guest speaker is uh, Coach Andrew McGlynn, a um, longtime buddy of mine out of University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. Excited to have uh, have Coach McGlynn speak tonight on Pass Pro. All right, you got it, Coach. Guys, just the kind of the basis for this thing is is this goes back a long time for me in terms of how I've thought and. Uh, I can think back to, to 20 years ago when I was still playing about, okay, this is what we're trying to do, but how do you necessarily do it? And I still, I still think back to a, to a time my senior year where I just, I couldn't figure out the timing of my punch. And I, I went back and, and I pulled the guy aside to figure it out. I've, I've just enjoyed uh, trying to figure those things out. So this is, uh, this is my interpretation of the details of how you want to, possibly think about how you want to teach your guys to move to get to get where we're going so within this the objective and, and I, I looking at these pictures I, I looked at it and I'm like gosh you can look all over the place and probably the only guy where I actually like is set on this thing is the center where he's balanced he's also he's also uncovered on a slide side right now but left tackles over set the left guard is spread out too far uh, right guard's got his knee way outside the posture of the right tackle. They're, they got an uh, ET running right there. Isn't really where I want it to be, but what I do like is, is number 12's got a clear vision for what he's trying to do and can just get back to his spot and throw. So obviously that's what we're going to try to do in drop back protection is have that pocket. Okay. And what I start off with is, is when I start teaching protection, to emphasize the point, I have two rules when we talk about drop back protection. Stay square and stay square. You will see within this, there are times when that is broken. Uh, there, there's going to be times where that's not possible or the, uh, the player we're going against breaks us down in that way. And we have some, uh, some bailout techniques that we'll look to do. But to understand how to stay square is just so vital. And when, you, when I get new guys in, they don't understand that concept, especially when you inter when you have more width as that player. They all want to turn the shoulders, turn the hips to that to that defender on an edge, and uh, I, they learn pretty quickly that uh, that is going to be trouble for them. So we just overemphasize staying square with with, with whatever you're doing. Okay. To me, the, the reason why this is so hard. Uh, the, the spot, if anybody's been around, the spot's been a, ter a term that's been used for a long time. And the spot changes every second of the play, depending on the defender's path of where he's going. So as the defender works upfield, the spot changes every step he takes. And when we have a lateral separation, this guy starts to get worked up on things. And I'd still love our left tackle here to be a little bit more square off of the set. It was his first year starting. Uh, this is still pretty early in the year. But I love the position in terms of the lateral positioning and understand where he's at to protect the quarterback. And what, what, I, what I say to the guys is, is you, have to you have to retrain your eyes. Because whenever we have that lateral separation early, is when we start to freak out. So I tell them their eyes are gonna to lie to them at first. And, and, and in all honesty, I'm, I've been trying to figure this out and I'm gonna try some other things this spring to maybe help with it, but I don't know if it's worth it or not, so I'm not gonna share it yet until I've had time to play with it in spring ball. But in all honesty, to teach pass protection, you have to allow your players to fail over and over again so that they have enough data to say that, okay, uh, on that angle, at that speed, I can see that, yeah, I was too vertical in my set or whatever that may be. Uh, we're teaching them to get to a spot that they can't see that's continuously changing. I think that's really hard. So when you, when you get going, when I talk about you have to allow them to fail, hopefully that's through enough practice reps that uh, that they get those those things so it doesn't happen within your game day. But uh, when you're teaching this for the first time, the new guys, I, I think they have to fail over and over again for this to really um, to take graphs so they can so they can process and, and get the information they need other than just, hey, do the best you can. That's that's really what I tell the guys that, to start and think about those cues of staying square. And then we'll talk about the hands as we get going. 
Okay, so this is this is the shot of that picture. I want you to watch the left tackle here and, and gets a little bit juked out by that head fake. But in the end, he takes away the spot. I always tell, tell my guys, make them go to their secondary move. Most of the time, a defensive lineman in me is a lot like a, a, a pitcher, especially if you think about a relief pitcher. They've got a primary and they've got a secondary. If you make them go to their third third pitch, not too many of them are you Darvish where they can go into that bag and have a comparable third pitch. So they're going to try something on you, and then they're going to have a counter, and then they're probably going to be out of moves after that. But I just love the fact that he stays relatively square. We'll get to talking about a pillar here, and we just keep on widening it throughout. My right tackle's not taking the type of set I want in terms of staying square, but that guy's so strong that he can kind of get away with not having as clean a technique at times. Center does a tremendous job of just staying square, getting into the spot, and the team we're playing Oshkosh here is, is a team that likes to kind of spot rush and, and hold off and keep everybody in the pocket. So we were always more comfortable with not ricocheting off and just kind of staying and waiting for second level blitzers or first level, first level players who are standing, not rushing and coming through. But really the focal point here is that left tackle to just understand where that spot is and to take it away, which really happy with what he did there. Certainly things to clean up and I try not to get crazy about it. So as we go into this, I want you to think about, to me, it was always a translation of, of what you do in the weight room compared to how that plays out in the field. Um, so if we were to think about a squat, guys have their knees slightly out, toes slightly out, sit the hips back, but we're only we're thinking about a vertical force coming down on us with gravity. When we're playing ball, we've got some forces that are, are working on us. So we have that linear, so straight through our chest would be that force. We have a lateral force. A lot of the times that's just our body trying to move in position, but we can have that incorporated at times, especially when you think about a spiker on an ETT trying to get to us laterally. And then we have angled force, and that's what we're usually dealing with. Uh, very rarely do we just get one or the other. It's coming in an angle, so we've got to calibrate ourselves in terms of knowing what we're doing. That's not only with the spot itself, but in truth, I think that holds, holds true to your points of contact. And I, I think about it this way. Humans are bipedal. They have two points of contact. Their arms work in opposition. Uh, little known fact, searching for images here, they actually sell that chair. I guess it's supposed to uh, help with your core strength. Uh, it doesn't look very comfortable. Now, if we were quadrupeds, if we could just be on our hands and feet and, and move in that way. So if you think about some sort of uh, like mountain cat or something like that, gosh, they'd be tremendous pass protectors. And if you look at that chair, just being that big and square, it takes some effort to get around it. So it's not necessarily the force that he's holding on to, but just by staying square, you have to work the whole width of that chair and move around. So now as, as we incorporate this, if we think about think about this chair only having those two points and they're laterally the same thing. If our feet are laterally the same thing, we are going to be susceptible to any type of force, whether it's linear or angled, to be able to be able to throw us off and just drive us. And in the same breath, if we would turn and quarter turn and face that with two hands, we don't have a brace to stop anything. So we have to manufacture this a little bit in regards to we're not growing extra legs. And, and so with our two points of contact, how do we get the most out of what we can do? So how do we survive with only these two points of contact? Here's, here's my thought process, process on it. And, and uh, the disclaimer with this would be think kick step and think working out in an outside shape. So with our interior leg, if we were to be a left or I'm sorry, a right side player. Our interior leg is going to be up. I would really like that toe to be straight ahead. Our exterior leg, the foot is going to be slightly back. And I truly believe in having some sort of lateral overlap with our feet. If I drop my exterior leg out and just throw that thing back, what's going to happen is if my exterior leg is the right leg, my right hip is going to open eventually. My right shoulder is going to follow. So 
what we have to think about is how, what, why do we have to have these things in, in place? And I firmly believe that anytime we move, especially when we incorporate lateral movement, everything is about pushing opposite. If, if you reach, you will open and you will be slow. So if I'm going to move to the right, that really has to come through the power of the left foot pushing opposite so that I can have the weight loaded up in that left foot to push right and move right. So the interior leg is going to be what drives lateral movement on an outward path. And based on where you push off the foot on the inside foot and and the angle of that knee where I want to go with it. So if I push off the push off the true instep or the, the crease of the foot, it can be really lateral. If I want that to be a little more uh, angled back and get more depth off of it, I'm still going to push off that inner curve, but there's going to be a little bit more press off of the, the top of the foot towards the ball of the foot. And I'm not going to roll up on the ball. I'm still going to have that whole foot in the ground, but I'm going to push off of that to get a little more depth off of what we're doing. When we think about what the exterior leg is doing then, is it establishes the brace. So if you have that force, and we, especially if we think about an angled contact, that exterior force is gonna be able to be in the ground and absorb that force. And then as we incorporate our hands into it, if you don't have that exterior foot set, and the same thing would truly be, be comparable with the interior foot, we need to really have two points of contact. But if I had to choose one, the exterior foot is going to be a little more important for having the energy to go through the ground, through that leg, through the hip, into my core, and then into my hand as we go. If you just try to throw a hand, there's not going to be anything with it. My balance is really going to be tough. So if there's any sort of clear or movement by the defender, um, I think he's going to get to that wrist and you're not going to have a next move off of that to, to adjust to So I want you to think about points of the points on the clock, and I, I reference this all the time. And, and hell, half of our guys don't even know what this means at first because they just have just have smart watches and they don't know what one of these things look like. So if we were to think about uh, what we're doing here, I reference points on the clock, and, and just like they taught us in driver's ed, we're really going to operate between ten and two as we point, uh, depending on the side. I'll break it down here for you so you can understand it a little bit better. So with our, with our left, if we're on the left side, and, and left side people are in a left-handed stance for me, right side people are in a right-handed stance. If I'm on the left side, as our starting point goes and we, we take a kick out, I really want my right foot, my inside foot to be at 12 o'clock, and I'm going to open my left foot, and I can go as far as 10 o'clock on that. So I tell them they can open two hours. Are some guys more 10, 30, or 1 o'clock? Sure. If I stay at 12 on both of those, if I stay at 12 on my outside foot, my left foot in this case, I just don't think we have any brace and we're really susceptible to being hit on that shoulder and being pressed back. On the same route, if I take that foot and go to nine o'clock with my left foot moving out, the first thing that's going to happen is the torque through the knee. It's just too darn much. And the knee is going to open up. As soon as the knee opens up, I lose all that power. So we've really found the sweet spots really at about 10 o'clock. Some guys are a little bit more vertical to 1030, but those guys have to play with it. And then once again, we're going to have that lateral overlap. If we're thinking right side, so the interior foot would be left. That's at 12 o'clock. If there's some variance by about a half hour, it's not a big deal. I just don't want the interior foot to be open because now I can't get any depth off of it. It has to be lateral. And that movement slower because, because the toe working out doesn't allow my knee to stay inside. It springs it out and we lose some force within that. And then same thing now, just, just inverse because we're working on the right side. The furthest I want to go is two o'clock with that right foot. If it's 1.30, that's, that's fine. If I go to three o'clock, that, that right knee is going to follow and I lose strength and I lose balance off of that. So we're, we're going to try to avoid that. And guys have to play around with that to figure that structure out. So we talked about the lateral intersection. This one's a little bit deep, but once again, a photo, I'm not sure where he's at with this. If this is just getting down, I think that heels up on the ground, but I'd really like the, I'd really like the term tent stake where that right instep enters the ground at about a 45 degree angle. And I tell my guys, I'd like them to cut the grass or cut the turf 
with the bottom of their cleats. We don't need to step over anything. It's about picking up and then angling back down as we get to that insert. And, and we look at overstretching, obviously the inseam of a man is going to be, uh, is going to dictate how far a kick is, but however, whatever the distance of the kick is, the, the drag foot has to come to the same distance, no far nor less, otherwise we'll have our base condensed or eventually we'll become overstretched and we'll open up with that. We do have a good example here of the knee being loaded inside the instep. I talked about gaining force from the ground. So this surface, if you if we were to play this game on sand, we wouldn't be able to move as fast because that would that would slide on us. But since we have a pretty stable stable surface, having the knee inside allows us to press off that instep, have that spring through to the knee, to the hip, and push off as we go. And now, as we land, the right hip into the glute is going to is going to absorb this, take the weight off, so we can drag this foot through. The brace knee is torqued to keep the hip square. So I talked about left side being at 10 o'clock, right side being at two o'clock. Yes, the toe can point that way, but we have to torque the knee in. If we were to let the knee go at the same angle as the toe, the hip would open. The whole key to staying square with this is torquing that knee and it's really uncomfortable for guys. And that knee has to be slightly in front of the foot for this thing to work. Not so far, if it's past the toe, we'll pick up the heel and we, we eliminate everything. But it's just gotta be inside to torque off of this so that we can have that land absorb and be ready to either take another kick, shift, shift back to the inside foot, or maybe we get an inside move where this thing's gotta be loaded so I can move my body inside and have that weight through. Once we've taken that kick, if, based, if we're still analyzing, I'd like the weight to be right through the midline of the body, kind of hanging through that and having weight on each side so we can press opposite to go through. But the weight's gotta be through those insteps for that to happen. Okay. Now, when we think about this, this, this can be applied to anything. I found that um, it certainly helps with pass sets. I found at times it helps, it helps my guys a ton in the run game, uh, especially if you're backside on like a zone concept and you're thinking about getting the back knee through. This thing applies the same way. So when we talk about lateral, we're talking about, we talk about the midline of the body. We're working away from the midline of the body sideways. Whenever we move laterally, we have to lead with the ankle. That keeps our chain in place. Uh, if we were to lead with the knee, our chain's broken. We're going to have so much leakage laterally that uh, we're not much good. And whenever you, in, in, in the inverse, whenever you have a medial movement towards the midline of the body, you have to lead with the knee. So if I were a right side player taking a kick step, my lateral movement, I've got to move my right ankle, that leads, and my left knee leads to get back inside. If I were a left side player, my left ankle leads, my right knee leads to get back to, to, to the midline medial off of that. So if your guys can understand that concept, that's great. It's going to take them a little bit of time to figure out where their knees are in relation to but just slightly knocked and on top of the instep, they, they pick, they've picked up on that okay for me. They really have, okay? And then the types of sets. Um, I go back and think about the cool clinic years ago when Coach McNally uh, presented some of his new stuff and he had uh, Paul Marty tell me how many years worth of DVDs he had about the post or the power step. Um, and I get the concept of having the inside leg up. I really do. But I always thought, gosh, I'm so damn slow at doing this. And then when I became a coach, I, all my players were really slow at doing that because you're working against your hip. So the only time we'll work inside with the inside foot up is when I've got a head, head up defender and I want to just get slightly to the inside half. I just call that a power adjust. So they're just, they know they're just moving slightly inside so that defender truly doesn't have a two-way go. But if we were to have a, an inside technique on us, or you have an outside technique that works an inside move, I work a flip kick. So all that does is if I'm a right side player, now I incorporate the left side movements. My left foot can now work to 10 o'clock and my right foot will be at 12. And I'm working inside off of that. I know that's uh, some of you are thinking, well, you drop your inside foot, you're going to give it up. I'm giving up a little initially, so hopefully I can flatten that thing through. And truly, when I teach it, I just keep using the terms flip and flatten, flip and flatten, flip and flatten. 
Because when we flip, we're going to have to take probably a minimum of four flip kicks to get back inside. And my thought process is I got to get that nose back to the inside half to prevent him from getting vertical penetration off of this. Uh, so if I give up a yard initially, I'm willing to do that to flatten him back across the width of, width of the quarterback's launch point, especially when you're thinking your guards. But it can hold true the same way for tackles about being able to just stop that penetration on an angle. Uh, anytime we have an outside defender, we're going to kick set. And I, I, I completely believe in angle kicking uh, that you can get deeper based on a wider technique or a, a technique continuing to gain width as he goes through. Um, but vertical kicking, I just think you lose all of your brace and that guy gets to work downhill as you're working straight back. And, and, um, I just don't think we give our guys a chance if we do that. There's just no room for error. And now your width is right next to the quarterback and, and it's, it becomes feeding time at that point in most cases. So as we think about the use of the hands, I'll teach a pillar. And I teach independent hands with almost everything. I'll show you one example where I don't, but they still theoretically work independently of each other. To me, the pillar is your outside hand, loose hand hitting with the heel, because no matter how big you are, you've just got bone and a little bit of skin, a little bit of cartilage on that. It's it, You're, you're going to have a solid piece there. And I would like all the force through my lower body, into my hips, into my tricep and lat, through my hand, to be in a small area to hit that defender. If we can stop him by the force, great. If we just get our hand on him and have a shot, that's where we start with everything. It's not about throwing a knockout. It's just about getting your outside hand on that defender's outside pack. Somewhat close to the sternum. We certainly don't want to play out here to the armpit, but just get the hand on the pack. Get the outside hand on the pack. And if you think about your hands, if you all just sitting there, I, I, you got to teach us independently. If I'm saying stay square and I still say punch with two hands, I'm just reaching to the side. I can't do that. The only way I can be balanced is if I turn hips and shoulders. So if I reach out and then just put my hands out, that right, your left hand's probably just to your wrist and your right hand's out. Your right hand's just so much longer. One arm is always longer than two. So I'll teach that. And then with our lift, when you have that inside move, I don't think there's any surface to punch unless that player you're going against isn't very good. But in theory, if he's working inside, he's going to dip the outside shoulder. There's not much for you to punch. So I talked about getting the nose to the inside half to the inside sternum and trying to flatten them out. What I teach is a lift and I'll just say lift the toll gate and palm up. I'm strongest in anatomical position with the palm up. And I'm just holding that thing up so he runs into it so I can get I can get my nose back across. And if I can just stop him with that gate being up, it's, it's not pretty. It's not going to knock him out. But he has to get through that. And in essence, that arm becomes a similar path to what we used to talk about with the knee on a pull step. So they just throw that thing up. Sometimes they hook the armpit if that guy's going through. Even if that guy's pushing through and the arm's just there and we're moving our feet to the inside, um, I've yet to have a guy get called for holding because we're not actually grabbing anything. The arm's just up, the palm is open and, and through. I'm not looking to grab anything. I'm just getting that there so I give myself a chance to get my body back through onto it. Okay. With your pillar, I talked about the first two points. Uh, we're going to strike the outside pectoral. We're going to strike with the heel of the hand. And there's a, there's a little bit of a, a, a art to this. They're going to just kind of push to start. It's about coming low to high and being able to snap the wrist through. So you have to have loose fingers and be able to hit with that heel. And what they have to understand is if we take a line through our shoulder and have it be vertical, the maximum angle that we're going to punch on ever is a 45 degree angle. If I punch laterally off of that, I'm going to lose that defender. I expose my shoulder in extension. I've got real no power. And if he, if he clears that, I'm probably going to open my gate. So the most I'm going to do is punch at a 45 degree angle. If we think about this being, being through 45 degrees. So if you look at that picture, my left tackle is not in a position to throw that pillar yet. He's got to take another kick if that defender's working straight up field in order to be in position to punch the outside. If he punches the inside half, what will happen 
is that outside hand is clear enough. He's going to clear that, clear that arm. His shoulder is probably going to work forward. And now he's to my hip and we can get to that point. And this is the same still shot of the, the live clip I, I showed you earlier. I mean, you can you, we know that he takes another kick. My right tackle, on the other hand, is in a position to punch at a 45 degree angle and still have that success. He'd be even, even more. It's probably about a 30 degree angle, which I would really prefer. I don't want to punch straight ahead and be flat because now um, if I get too, too loose with any of my set, he's nose to nose with me and I give him a two way go with that. I, I want to work nose to a side of the sternum just so we can kind of control half of that as you go through. So just some different examples with this left tackle again here, you're going to see that, gosh, he really doesn't even in, in, involve his inside hand much. I think it sets a little too vertical. We're working on that, but he stays square and just pillars the outside half and the defender really doesn't know what to do. Now, once the defender works to the inside half, we can involve our inside hand, but we don't want to reach across with it. Center has good tempo. We got a field slide off of this thing. The left guard does a poor job on this. Doesn't get his pillar. Hands, hands hanging really low. Doesn't get over enough. He, if he were to pillar, he'd be on the outside half. That thing would have been cleared. Now he's kind of in that bail technique that we talked about where, hey, that guy's got the room on it. You've just got to run block and widen him if he's got your half on it. And he does a nice job of recovering where the defender actually spins back in for some reason. So we're able to salvage that. Another example, it's left tackle again to start. You can see the pillar to the outside half automatically widens the defender's rush. And once that defender starts shuffling, we're in a better control position off of this. You can see eventually he grabs. So he goes from a pillar and he grabs that plate and the defender doesn't have the ability to restart. You can see the difference then with the right tackle. The right tackle opens, two hand punches and he's on the outside half. Thankfully he's strong enough where he can drop his hips, but still not ideal for what we want. The two eye is just kind of sitting there the center just throws his pillar out, works through, just have a two-man go, no blitzers. We, we can sit on it. We can work to ricochet. It's all based on what these guys are calling off of it. And you can see it's not a great example by our right guard where he sets to a kick, gets an inside move. He drops the inside foot. I'd like him to keep working in, but it's enough where that defender doesn't think he can press vertically anymore. And once he works back out, we feel we're in a pretty good position. If he works outside, inside, and then back outside, that just takes a lot of time. Okay. So with the lift, we talked about lifting the toll gate with that inside hand. Nose to the inside sternum. So now the inside foot's that brace, and the out, we push off the outside foot. That fit, the outside foot's going to be our motor, and we've got to work to flatten this thing as we go through, as I said. Left tackle again, gets an inside move right away from a, from a, a walk up. It doesn't look pretty. His base condenses too much. And here's the thing guys will get in trouble with when we have an outside in movement off of this. When he commits to kick, it's not just one step. It's kick and drag. So whatever I kick here, I drag that same amount. If I get an inside move right away off of it, it's left, right, right, left. If I go left, right, left, and try to cut this inside foot off and swing it back around, I guarantee you you'll open your hip way too much. And the natural inclination for, for those guys is, well, if I take three steps, it'll be faster than four. What you'll become is you'll become overstretched with your feet and you'll just open the gate because your groin won't allow you to do it. Your groin is trying to say, I'm either going to tear or you're going to open your hip and it makes that choice for you. But just by lifting, even though the head's on the backside half, it's enough where that doesn't vertically penetrate. We, we get caught in the safety blitz to the boundary, but it's still clean enough where we're able to throw off of it. Well, it's incomplete. Maybe it wasn't clean enough, but 
in theory, we're still in good shape within that because we're, we only have a five-man protection off of this. You're also seeing it by the, by the left guard who has a two-eye. He's in this, in this protection, he's locked on the two-eye unless he crosses over the center's face. So he's just going to keep going, sits, works the center's midline, but he's just there. So it looks like a full slide protection, even though it's not by, by the scheme. The defense dictates that we had a full slide going on by that look. See it by the by the right or the left guard here has a natural two eyes, so he's going to flip right away out of his stance. Ends up working really well. I think they're trying to work an NT on this thing, but we flatten it so much that the center's not able to get picked. And we had issues with that with like some teams ran two ones on us and we're, we're running both run and, and uh, pass stunts off of this and picking the center, especially in run stuff. But we flatten this thing so the center doesn't get picked. He can stay square and we don't have to worry about a whole lot because they run into each other. So now that thing's kind of taken care of. We go back to the pillar look, the left tackle, you can see it. He's, he's starting to time it up. I'm getting a little nervous that he's showing too much off of this, that when we keep the hand out and extend it, that that's a free shot at our wrist. And, and a huge proponent, not only to stay square, what I think about is if we have our hands together, we the defender can get a two for one. So if our hands are together, even if he's straight through us, um, he can get a two for one pretty easy. So if he clears my, my left wrist, He'll knock my right wrist out of the way, and then I'm, I'd have to, I'd have to really uh, be trained and almost get back to my Howard Munn principles of reversing out to have any shot. But that's still a, that's still a tough go as we think about it. Okay, thinking about the attachment of the second hand, whether that's uh, the backside hand on a on a lift or the inside hand on a pillar. Okay. We want either the lift or the pillar, depending on what we have to throw based on the leverage of the movement, to be the high hand. Okay, The second hand will attach when the defender crosses our midline. So I don't want to have to reach across my body to, to attach that. As soon as that thing becomes where I can keep the hand in front of the sternum or over, that's where I'm going to go through. You saw a lot of examples where my left tackle is just sitting here with the pillar and holding it and just bracing and resetting his feet and flopping. I'm fine with that because it allows them to stay square and the defender's not dictating that I should involve my outside hand or my inside hand in that case, I'm sorry. So when we think about the attachment of the, of the second hand, if it's a pillar, I've got that on the pack. I've really just had my guys open palm and, and just slap the hell out of that belly and try to grab. Normally there is some sort of air or adipose tissue that's pretty easy to grab. At this point, jerseys are pretty damn good where you can't grab those. But when you do it right and snap, it's a pretty big surface area you can grab. And I will guarantee you, you'll get the defender's attention if you grab a chunk of, of fat and squeeze it. They're going to raise up. They're going to slow down their, their structure within this. And if we do it with a, with a lift, if I were to be working to the inside as a right side player, I lift here, I get my nose across, and ideally I take my backside hand and push his hip through. Because if I do that, if he's already bending and trying to get his, in this case, the left hip through, if I flatten that hip and get it to face back towards, not instead of being at towards the line of scrimmage or laterally, if I can get that thing turned back up to his, his side of the field, he can't penetrate. Wherever your pelvis is pointed is where you're going. So if I can flatten that backside hip and just push on it and help with a rotation, there's a little bit of a torque with the inside hand and a push here. You can corkscrew that guy into the ground. Now, once it crosses, I just want to be able to lock. I'm not going to take it across my body, but just enough to get going. And then I can, if, if I get him to corkscrew the opposite way, it's unless he can full turn out of it to the backside, I've yet to see that at, at our level. Okay, when do I two hand punch? I use the term refrigerator magnets. So, it's mainly going to be for our interior guys. Normally our tackles have, have guys, even if they're lined up in a four or four eye, uh, their B gap insert, they're, they're moving back out afterwards. 
Very rarely do our tackles have a guy work down their chest, but our guards and centers will have that happen. So you can punch with two hands at the same time if you get a guy who's just straight ass blowing you right down your sternum. I would still tell you, I don't think your hands should be together when you do that. I still think it's going to be pillar and, and grab on this on, uh, at the same time, or it's pillar grab almost instantaneously, but it's there can be a slight separation, just not as much. So uh, I do have a clip for that. If you watch our center here, those double ones, we slide to it and it, we're, the guy's just completely covered up. So go ahead and grab. And he, he's a little high with his inside hand, but he's getting to the plate and just sitting on it. I'm fine with that. We got it covered completely. Hands are shooting at the same time. Sure. You can see what happens when you have width. If you watch our right guard here, he ends up throwing both hands at the same time, but watch what happens before he throws to, to have that happen. He turns out, you can see that he's leading with his knee rather than his ankle to, to with his right side. And you're getting the knees out. Whenever you have that diamond structure in the lower body, you shuffle. And when it, the only time I want my guys to shuffle is when we run power and you shuffle, pull, and insert vertically. That's the only time I want you to shuffle. Shuffling doesn't have contact points in the ground. It's a weak movement. It's a slower movement. I really don't want to have that as part of the structure. So you can see by that example where we punch with two hands at the same time, he has to turn. He just has to. Going back, we have like a four technique on our on our uh, tackle or the tightest five in the world. I, I don't know. But he power adjusts to start. Then he goes to a flip. Guy works back out. Pretty well done. Okay. So I, I talked about with this that there's an exception and about staying square. And you're going to see our left tackle is not doing great with it, and our right tackle is, okay? The old pigeon toe technique learned from Bill O'Boyle. And the reason why we call it a pigeon toe is with whatever the outside foot was, which becomes the inside foot as we go, we want to have that toe pointed back out so that we keep our hip locked and loaded, and we can press this defender and keep them working upfield as we go through. If we allow the toe to point back to our quarterback, the same thing I talked about with our defender. If our toes are pointed to the quarterback, I call that a tether ball. You're just turning back to it, and that defender is going to wrap and get right to the right to the aiming point. But as we go through, so if we think about this, and I've, I've got the live clip of this as well, but I'll talk through the coaching points first, is we actually end up changing our hands. So when this defender widens, so we saw some paths where they just start working out. And this is another thing that the tackles, especially, I only really want the tackles to do this technique because the guards don't have enough width to play with it. But as the tackles use this technique, this guy's widening and now he's getting to the depth or, or behind the quarterback's launch point, which is for us is typically at about five yards on, on our drop back. I don't want, if he keeps widening, you're, you'd have to punch more than a 45 degree angle. You're just going to open yourself by doing that. So if this guy continues to widen, drop your outside hand, let him get over the top. And I want you to ride his backside hip. And I want you to take your hand, take the V of the hand and put it right on the crease of the hip. Once again, if I can push this hip flat this way, he can't turn his hips to bend to the quarterback. So now I'm trying to push the hips up field and ride this thing through. In this case, my, my left tackle kept his outside hand on it and you'll watch to see how fast he spins on this, on this clip. Doesn't help we opened up and two hand punch that thing. That's a tough position. This defender gets a two for one on us. You can see how quickly he's bending the edge off of this to be able to get back to the quarterback. Any defender can run past the depth of the quarterback and run around it, but uh, the good ones will be able to bend back through and circle that through, and that certainly flushes our quarterback out. Our right tackle does a really nice job. He sees that the defender continue to widen. That guy goes to hand clear. You see early on a little bait technique. Our right tackle is just throwing that out to see if he can get the defender to show his hands and throw off his timing. 
He actually misses on his pillar, but he drops his outside hand, becomes free. And if you just look at the posture difference of this, watch how, watch how the right tackle just controls that guy by the line of scrimmage. And that's all it really needs to be. Now the quarterback can step up, and we've got a decent little window there. If that quarterback is engulfed, then we're in trouble. So. Well, that was a great presentation. Uh, just before we close up, though, if anybody has a question, just go ahead, unmute yourselves. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll wrap it up. So appreciate you putting that presentation together for us. Well, awesome. Thanks a lot, guys, for jumping on.